Good morning. I will be reading Lamentations 3, 17 to 25. Again, that's Lamentations 3, 17 to 25. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait with him, for him. The Lord is good to those who, whose hope is in him, to the ones who seek him. Glad you're with us this morning. Hopefully you're as happy to be here as God is to have you here. It is a beautiful day. Last time I seen you, my wife was knocked off her feet. Right? And I didn't do it. <laughs> um, just a little update for everybody. I, I know you all are concerned. I really appreciate your prayers. The support you all have been given. It has been a blessing. Uh, and we thank you for it. Tina is still in a lot of pain. Um, her shoulder still bothering her pretty bad. The swelling still pretty bad around her head, knee, and shoulder area. Uh, she has a doctor's appointment tomorrow at the at the orthopedic surgeon, so maybe we'll get some answers and some help for that. Uh, but right now she's just in recovery mode and and uh, going through a lot of pain. So please continue to keep her in uh, your prayers. I want to thank everybody for the meals that y'all have given us. Our refrigerator has never been so full, right? It is a blessing to um, have that much love pouring out of your refrigerator. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you once again on our behalf. Uh, another thanks to my granddaughter, Layla, doing such a great job for a teenager uh, to have this much um, responsibility put on her. She's handled it very well. I'm grateful to her, and I'm grateful for all the people that uh, are helping her with that uh, in the way that you are being Christians. Uh, she gets to see you. Uh, she gets to see the value of it, and she gets to learn from uh, the example you set forth. Grateful that you're here this morning. We are going to talk a little bit about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Imagine that from the Church of Christ pulpit, right? That is, that is not something that should blow our minds, but it, should, it is something that should change our lives. And that's what I wanted to do. I want us to grab a hold of the, the, the depth of the meaning of having such a loving Savior as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On behalf of the church here at Sun Valley, we want to welcome our visitors. We are glad you're with us. We don't want to see you as vis uh, visitors very long. We hope that you like what you hear because it is the Word of God, and that'll bring you back uh, at every time we get together. And I'll bet you're wondering. I could see it in your faces. When is the next time you're getting together, Cub? So I'm glad you asked me that because it's at 6 o'clock this evening. We're going to break the bread again the bread of life uh, for another portion of God's word. And we invite you to come and be part of that wonderful celebration. Thank you men for yesterday. Um, I didn't get a chance to say hi to Steve. I seen him, but I didn't say hi to him. But uh, and, and I probably missed a bunch of you, but I do want to say I'm very grateful for your attendance yesterday, the fellowship that we shared, the joy, the laughter, and the food uh, was a bonus to all that. So thank you once again. Uh, today we're thanking our God and the greatest gift ever given to man, his son, Jesus Christ. And I want us to go into John chapter 14, and I want us to read real quick, if you will, uh, verses 1 through 6. It's going to be the meat of our message this morning, the message coming, of course, from the mouth of God. As he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Oh, church, we will do well. To hear this message, to understand what God is saying. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
and where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not where you know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you don't leave that passage without joy in your heart, there is something wrong with that clicker, that ticker, that thing in your chest, right? Uh, maybe it needs softening. Maybe it needs understanding. Whatever it may be, we're going we're gonna to re reach into that ticker and hopefully penetrate the things that are not letting this joy ring out within our heart. A man one time laying out in front of a beauty parlor, black and blued. A lady walked by him and she asked him, she said, sir, what's wrong? What, what happened to you? And he kind of said groggily as he rubbed off the pavement from his face and his bruised chin a little bit. And he said, well, the last thing I remember, he said, uh, my wife was coming out of the beauty salon. I took a one look at her and I said, well, honey, at least you tried. You know, we got a message that people don't like to hear. And the world beats us up. And they try to change our view. Our view is simple. Sin destroys a relationship with God. But thanks be to God that our victory is given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the world is satisfied with where they are in relationship to themselves, others around them, and also to God himself. And there's something we say at Sun Valley to answer that, and it's, ah, wrong answer. That can't be right. There is one way to be right, and it's through Jesus. And if my opinion gets in the way of the truth that Jesus has presented, then I need to change. I need to look at myself. I need to see if I am who God wants me to be. In John chapter 14, drop that down all the way down to verse 27, and notice what he says here, because this is the part, this is the whole conclusion of what it is that we're trying to get across today. In verse 27, Jesus cries out, Peace I leave with you. Now, if you go back to the book of Jeremiah, and you remember how many times Jeremiah had to say, Peace, peace, they were crying. But God said, there is no peace. The world is under Satan's attack. And they're not putting up a good defense system when they're not seeking God's resolution. And so they are constantly under siege of a hidden view of what peace is. Peace, summarized, is being right with God. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. Now we can celebrate, and we will, but notice what he says here. My peace I give to you. Oh, let that sink. Now remember, this is the same Jesus that was walking throughout the land, knowing there was a destination. I struggle being at peace knowing I got something to do that is difficult. I can't rest at night knowing I got this to do. I can't sleep. I can't relax. Yet Jesus had a peace knowing what lied ahead, laid, was there ahead of him in Jerusalem. Luke says that he set his face towards Jerusalem. Yet he was at peace. Peace with an understanding of where he was at in relationship with God. That's the peace that he left with us. He said, not as the world gives do I give to you. It's not the world's idea of peace, but it is God's idea of peace. Now the world now, an example is the world may have the most beautiful woman in all the land. 
We'll go in there and look in the mirror and say, now that's beautiful. But if she's not beautiful inside, God doesn't see that as beautiful. So Jesus is saying, my beauty I'm giving to you, not as the world gives, but a beautiful relationship with God. He goes on to say a piece that Jesus left graciously. I leave with you. A piece that he let go. A piece that was his, but it, the word means to give to someone else. I leave with you. To have it and then leave it, give it to someone else. Jesus did just that. He let go of that piece for us. He didn't hoard it. He didn't hold it. He didn't hide it. He gave it. And then he lent it to us because he said it's not the world's peace. The peace that Jesus left with us is the faith that whatever trial we face, whatever obstacle that the world is throwing at us, and believe me, that seemed to never run out of ammunition, we'll have peace in our faith, in our trusting in God. And these storms of life, they seem to be getting worse and worse. There's a big cry out here for climate change because of all the weather that's getting ugly. And what they need is an attitude change because the storms don't calm themselves. Only Jesus can calm the storms of life that come and try to tear our house down. So we need to be like the wise builder and build upon the rock. Because the worldly builder who builds on the sand in his own opinions, that house will be torn down. When we read this chapter, I hope these points come to mind as it did to me as I was looking at it this week. If there's somebody who needed peace this week, it's Cub. The gratefulness I have to my God is I knew where to go. We have a savior that brings us peace, even during the trials that we face. I'm like a fish out of water preaching in a pulpit without being able to see my wife. But I'm at peace. Knowing that Jesus is there with me and my wife. I have security. That Jesus in our life, that, that gives us the security blanket that we need. He's like the piece of chocolate in our times of trial, the calming effect. And folks, the greatest thing that we have that the world doesn't have that they need is that hope, a hope that goes beyond what we can imagine, a hope that says, Jesus said it, I expect it, I believe it, it's there. And folks, we have that hope. We leave this building today. I want us to leave with an understanding of how much God loves us. That he would send his only begotten son for us, Lane, that we could have this security, this peace, and this hope as we live in a world that is dying in its own vomit. God sent Jesus to rescue us. And as Jesus said in the first part of verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, context is, is he's, he's saying goodbye, in a sense, on the physical side of it, that he is no longer going to be with them, his apostles. And, and I could imagine, I mean, I've got to know Peggy so much that if she told me she was leaving, my heart would be troubled. What would I do without Peggy? Who could I tease about being a mature age? my heart would be troubled. The disciples would have gotten real close and dependent on Jesus. So their hearts were troubled at this time, but Jesus is very clear. To these guys, peace seems so far away right now. It, the Lord is getting ready to go through the crucifixion, the trials, all the things, the beatings, everything that is ugly. And so their hearts have every right to be troubled. 
I want us to leave here with this because if we're leaving here with nothing more, we're leaving with a gold mine, folks. Catch this. The peace that Jesus lives and, and leaves for us is not knowing that we have a peaceful life, but knowing life's peace. The road that we go down, the trials that we go through, they're there. They're, they're not going to change. God doesn't take us out of the trials. He walks with us through those trials. And I'm grateful for that. As the butterfly is grateful for the cocoon that he had to fight to get through. Because it strengthens us. It puts power. It puts purpose in our life. It gives us a reason to understand our great God. And so when we see Jesus talking like this, we understand that it... it do not let your hearts be troubled is what we call a, a passive tense. And it's saying that something is working in us. It's the life that is surrounded, the troubles that we're facing are working in us to cause us to doubt God, to cause our faith to be weakened, uh, to die out, to dismantle our faith, to doubt that God is working. One of the craziest statements, questions in the world, and probably one of the hardest to answer if we don't know God, is what do bad things happen to good people? I mean, when you study and learn about God, you understand. It, it, it's a hard road, but it's a road that we share with Christ on. He's with us on this road. And there are things in life that, that we read through the Bible that, that causes trouble. The doubt, the disbelief, the, the things that can lead us to doom. I'm remember, uh, reminded in Acts chapter 20 and verse 10, we see the trouble of confusion. Because you remember what happened? Peter, uh, Paul was preaching such a great sermon, it knocked the boy out. He was sitting in the window, remember? And he fell. And they were confused. They said, oh, I can't believe this man was in there listening to your sermon and died. And Paul said, his life's in him. Don't be confused. Don't be troubled. Do you remember? There's trouble of, of confusion for sure. There's trouble in suffering. 1 Peter chapter 3, sanctify the Lord in your heart. These sufferings, these trials, don't let them trouble you. These things are going to happen. But if we have Jesus sanctified in our heart as Lord, we'll get through these trials. We'll have victory. We will remain overcomers. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10 say that the disciples were troubled because the pressure was on. And they were told not to speak. And so they went and hid in their houses and quit preaching the word. No, they spoke with boldness. They prayed to God. They said, give us some place to hide. They said, no, that ain't what we said. They said, we asked God for boldness to go out and preach his word. Oh, when the troubles are out there, folks, do not let your heart be troubled. To say it properly, stop letting your heart be troubled by the world around you. That word troubled means to agitate, to disturb. And so Jesus cries out very clearly. I love the fourth psalm. Let's go over there real quick. Fourth psalm, let's look at verse 8. And I want us to see the wonders of God at work in this idea of peace. David writing the psalm, and he cries out in verse 8, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. Now to some people that may sound redundant, but I don't know how many times I've laid my head on that pillow and could not sleep. David is making sure that we understand the greatness of God's peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety now remember who's writing it's david there wasn't too much safety going on in david's life he was always at battle in fact god told him you are my man of war and so safety seemed to be something far away from david but he knew where to find it he knew that no matter what he faced he was in god's hands and to him that was safety that word um in the Hebrew language, means complete. That word for lie down and rest 
It means uh, God is working within us to remove the incompleteness of life. Do we get that? Oh, folks, hear me out. The incompleteness of life. You know what that means? Without God. When God is our life, it's complete. And God is wanting to, and remember Jesus, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'm going to say what he said, and I will make your life complete. He said, I know our Bible said, I will give you rest. But the idea is that I will help you through this life. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of what Paul said in the attitude or the psychology book in the Bible, Philippians. In chapter four, Paul said, you know, to not be anxious for things, but in everything. Not some things, not most things, but everything. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We find the peace in prayer. People, if you don't talk to God enough, you're probably not at peace. God is wanting to hear from us. Let's not treat God like a prayer vending machine. I say the prayer and wait at the bottom for the, the blessings to come out. God wants us, the word prayer means to converse, talk. You know, a basic, simple prayer, just staying, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Don't ever stop talking to God. I told Noah and Cassidy as we were getting ready for their wedding upcoming to not only invite God to the wedding, but invite him to the marriage. Bring him in your life. Don't treat him like something you go visit. Treat him like a king that reigns in your life. There's peace in that. There's peace in supplication. Do you understand who God is? He's the provider of all good things. Everything we can ask for can be given. When we know God, you know, I, I struggle with my, you, you know, my car. It's not doing enough. I can't sleep at night. Wait a minute. It runs. It gets me. It'll help me pick up a stranger that I can preach the word to. It is a good car. I'm at peace. Because God supplies it. Thanksgiving. We have a God that wants to provide. That says he will. You know what? He promises that if we ask, in the name of Jesus, that he will give whatever it is we ask for. Now, hold on, Miss Twilight, don't go asking for a million dollars. Because I don't think that's included. I think it means according to the will of God. We must know the will of God to understand the power of prayer. But that's what he promises. When you get that, when you know that, and you ask in Jesus' name, it will be given unto you. Be thankful for what you ask for. And God will supply everything that we need. We have a peaceful life. No, a life of peace. Knowing that our God is there for us to take care of us, to strengthen us, and to give us what we need to be successful in this walk, in this way of life. Now, the problem with it is we live in this flesh, right? And flesh always has its own logic to go by. I'll give you an example. We were at a party one time, a celebration, I think it was a marriage wedding that me and my wife were at. And my wife, kind of jokingly, she tells me, well, that's the fourth time you've got up and got a piece of chocolate cake and ice cream. She goes, doesn't that embarrass you? And I said, why should it? I keep telling them it's for you. See the logic? Huh? I'm at peace. Uh, wrong answer. I wasn't at peace. I was in deep darkness at that time but the logic came from my flesh jesus says he is our peace he's there at all costs for us and the things that we face he promises success if we'll trust in him and we'll relax and rest on what he offers what he gives us folks jesus says do not let your heart be troubled don't let the world affect our love for God, our peace. Not only is it peace, but look at the security. Going back over John chapter 14. Believe in God, believe also in me. So they get this. The, the Jewish people believed in God. They knew he was there. 
But now Jesus says something different. Addition. Don't only believe in God, Jack. Believe in God's plan. That's what Jesus is saying. You believe in God. That's, that's doing well. James said that too. <laughs> Even the demons believe and shudder. You should believe and be secure. No reason to shudder. God has got this. Believe in God's plan. There's security in God's power. There's security in God's purpose. And hear me out. There's security in God's presence. Do you know he is amongst us today? Ooh, that got a little twilight zone-ish, didn't it? But he's here. He promises that. When we worship him, you know, our knees should tremble right now. We should be sitting at attention, if you will, from the military term, right? Because our God is in our presence. He is amongst us. Now, you think about that. We believe in God. But let me ask you, do you believe in his promises? Because he promises he's with us. Are we hearing that? Are we too busy thinking about other things right now? We forget the reverence that he's due. We believe in God, but now we can believe in his plan. I want us to turn in our Bibles, Matthew chapter 1. And I want us to look at verses 21 through 23. Watch this pop out at us. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Folks, we can believe in his plan, see, because Jesus came to save us from our sin. Do we hear that? Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. That stuff that made us sick and killed that relationship that God had uh, in mind for us when he put us on this earth that we allowed Satan to drag us out of and live in sin, separated from our God. And yet sometimes we are baptized and we allow Satan to do that to us again. I say, no, no, because I want the security. There's no security in sin. Is there security in death? I don't think so. Right? There's security in life, and God gives that through the removal of sin. He's also sent to testify to God's faithfulness. Remember, he, he reminds us about the prophet. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. This is God's faithfulness. I promised it's here. I told you, and now it's here. God is grateful. God is gracious to us. And so when we believe in his plan, we believe that he's going to carry it out. And then he also testified to God's faithfulness and to save us from sin and that God is with us. Verse 23. He's with us. Folks, that's a promise. We forget that sometimes. We allow ourselves to be caught up in the world and do the things of the world and then we get a minute to think and we say, oh, yeah, that's right. God's with us. I forgot. Let's not forget because that's what Satan wants us to do. And so I want to encourage us today. I want us to turn in our Bibles, Romans chapter 8. And I want us to look at a great passage that has to do with God's conquering in verse 31. Chapter 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing can defeat us. You know what Paul just said? There is nothing in this world. Are you hearing me? Nothing in this world that can defeat us. Now, question is, what's defeat? I didn't say there ain't nothing in this world that can't cause us to miss a car payment. There ain't nothing in this world that can't cause us to have our wife get hurt in the foyer. But these things can't defeat us. They can't, they can't stop us from being faithful to God. They can't steal away our joy. Look at verse 32. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? The deliverance, folks, 
We have victory in the deliverance that God gave us. God sent Jesus to deliver us, to deliver us from the evils of this world, to deliver us from sin, to deliver us from death. And look at verse 34. Who, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, the victorious and authoritative and powerful right hand of God who also intercedes for us. He's our judgment. We're not going to be defeated in judgment, folks. God is there. He's our security. And look at the power in verse 37. All these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. When you leave this building today, I want you to know if you are in Christ Jesus, you are leaving here a victor. I didn't say you're leaving with victor. Right? Although he's probably got some good food over his house. Guaranteed. We might want to go there anyway. But we are leaving not with Victor, but as a Victor. Because God has promised that. That is God's promise. That's the security we have. Sometimes we say things that aren't so secure. Mark Twain was quoted one time. He said, last week I stated that this woman was the ugliest woman I had ever seen. I have since been visited by her sister, and now I wish to withdraw that statement. <laughs> How many statements do we have to withdraw because they're not based upon the security of God's word? How many times do we do things because we want to or we feel like we need to do them, but then we get out there and it's not so secure? I've seen marriages end because someone is not so happy with the spouse. And so they leave the island of security in that marriage to go into a world of insecurity only to see that house go crash. You don't need to change your spouse. You need to change what you find security in. The greatness of our God is that what he promises he gives us in that security is in his word. And in that word, we find hope. You know, Jesus is our hope. We have a great God that promises something. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. There's a place for us. God has promised that. And that's our hope. And when we say hope, we understand that God says, I'm preparing a place for you. He's preparing a place when Jesus died on that cross. That place has been prepared. That life is given to us. He's preparing us to now go to this great place that has been prepared. God has a desire that all men be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Colossians chapter 1, 27. If we go over there real quick and take a quick look here, we're going to find a, a little piece of gold. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I hope we get that. The hope of glory. What does that mean? There's glory waiting for us. When Jesus prayed, Father, I have glorified you, now glorify me. Where did Jesus be glorified when he was raised from the dead? That same glory is promised to us. That's a promise. That means it's there. We can expect it. We don't demand it. Hey, God, I want that glory now. We didn't say that. But we say, God, I've taken your life. I did it because we know there's glory there for us. You promised it. The steadfastness of hope. Jesus is that steadfastness, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. What keeps us going? Kathy, what keeps you going on a bad day? It's your hope in Jesus. The steadfastness. It don't quit. It's new every morning. God is there for us. And I love 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Notice what's said there as, as a reminder to us. After you've suffered for a little while, okay, that's it, I quit. I didn't know there was suffering involved. Yeah, we do, don't we? Uh, we know there's suffering, we get it. 
after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, the grace that carries you through that suffering, who called you in his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. If I miss something, please let me know. I think it's all covered. Everything we need to have that foundation of hope is laid right there at our feet. Our God is there for us, folks. We live in a world that doesn't know what hope is. Their biggest hope is on a lottery ticket. That's their biggest hope. Our greatest hope is that we remain faithful to receive the promises that we can expect from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sits where? At the right hand of victory and authority of God. You know, we let the world sometimes take us away from that easy chair of life and set us someplace we don't want to be. Some of you might remember Red Skelton. He was quoted one time about his wife. He said, she has an electric blender, she has an electric toaster, and she has an electric bread maker. And she has the nerve to come into my office and tell me there are too many gadgets and there's no place to sit down. So I gave her an electric chair. <laughs> there's no hope in man's logic. There's no hope in man's opinion. The hope of the world is just killing us, folks. The hope that we receive in Christ Jesus, that's eternal, Romans chapter 5. And this hope does not disappoint. Folks, we like Thomas need help. We need the help that only God can give us. As we close that passage out in verses 5 and 6, Thomas was very strugglesome. He said, I don't know the way. You and I do know the way. God has given us the hope and security of being in Christ Jesus. That hope and security is waiting for all of us. It is not an offer just to the church. This great security that God has given us allows us to share with you that where you are in life, what you are facing, you have somewhere to go. You have someone who loves you. You have somebody who died for you. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus for that peace. That world's going to lie to you. The world's going to kick you to the curb. Come to Jesus for that security. Life is so insecure. One minute you're up preaching the word, the next minute you're out picking up your wife. It's so insecure. But there's security in Christ Jesus. Come to him, folks. And that hope. My wife needs your prayers. Prayers of people that believe in the hope that we have in God. I want to encourage you today. If there's something going on in your life that you can't find peace, you can't find security, you can't find hope, there's a Savior that loves you and wants to bring you to Him. He invites you to come to that great rest. If you're here today and you've not been baptized into Christ, I pray you'll make the decision to do so and find these things that we've been talking about. Life is hard without Him. It's so much better with Him. If we can help you do that, we want to. I also want to encourage you, those of, that have obeyed the gospel, don't forget about the great hope, the peace, the security that we have in Christ. See, Satan's tricky, and he's very good, and he tries to make us not think that God doesn't love us. God, God doesn't care about me. My wife, my wife she, she fell in the, in the foyer. He doesn't really care about me. But he does. He does because he puts a family like you around us as we face this trial together. You might be facing something today that Satan's trying to use to get you to doubt God. We as a family want to gather around you and encourage you and remind you how special you are in God's eyes. If Satan's trying to get you discouraged with your wife, your spouse, with your pew, with your parking space, maybe with your preacher, please, don't let Satan defeat you by letting you doubt God. Trust in him and he will bring you that victory. Today we share in that victory. We want to share it with you. We'll, we'll do just that if you'll let us. Please take this opportunity right now to come forward.
as we stand and sing.